it's, it's my pleasure to continue on with our panel. We're going to be talking about technical barriers. And I think the answer at the back of the book is, there are none. We should be able to get there. <laughs> but it's still worthwhile to have the discussion and make sure that we go in with our eyes wide open and that we know what we're in for in reaching the 100% goal, that we do it smart, that we do it consistently, and that we do it efficiently in the best way possible for consumers. So with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, David Rene. You all have the bios, you can look in details. He's currently in his second term as the president of the International Solar Energy Society. And he retired from the National Renewable Energy Lab in 2012, and where he managed the programs on renewable energy resources. He still holds an emeritus status at NREL, and they publish all those wonderful studies we love to read. Thank you for Thank being you here, much. Dave. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for the invitation to be here today. This is a very uh, prestigious gathering of, of experts, expertise here, and I'm really proud to be here with that group. Uh, so even though the panel is called, uh, re makes reference to the barriers to achieve 100% renewables, I prefer to, re to refer to them as challenges, because with all challenges, there are, of course, opportunities, and I think that's what we're really looking at here, are the opportunities to get to 100% renewable energy future. So as we've already heard now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, I think it's already been mentioned in one way or another, but it, um, I just wanted to once again highlight that there are roadmaps available. There have been a number of very good publications over the past few years. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. These publications have either been looking at pathways to get to a, a significant penetration of renewable energy up to 100%. Some of them have also been related to achieving certain climate goals, such as capping at uh, 450 parts per million or so, uh, along those lines. Uh, recently, the Global Energy Assessment was published uh, by EASA. There's um, the IEA World Energy Outlooks, uh, often goes into scenario analysis um, and, the, and the global energy perspectives. Uh, energy Revolution, the Greenpeace Report, we've already heard quite a bit about that one. And the IPCC has gone through its own analysis of uh, renewable energy scenarios and the recent um, uh, report on renewable energy that they published, uh, Global Energy Perspectives, and um, the Energy Report by the World Wildlife Fund, of course, is, uh, come, came out fairly recently. And NREL, we've already heard some reference to the NREL studies. Uh, they initially did a look at 35% renewable penetration in the Western market in the United States, and more recently have published an 80% renewables scenario analysis. And I think the point in all of these studies, as was just mentioned, is that the, there are no real technical issues associated with getting to 100% renewables. I think the, the, even though the pathway studies all may take different approaches, the fundamental point is that there are no technical barriers. And um, the IPCC report, for example, highlights one key issue, and that is that the technical potential of renewable energy far exceeds even our um, wildest future projections. Uh, even each individual technology shows that it can, uh, e even deployed on, in its technical basis, can far exceed the uh, expected energy supply that's going to be required over the next 100 years. So that's so clearly the technical um, renewable energy potential is not a limiting factor. I was going to talk a little bit about solar. We've already seen some of these slides um, earlier. The uh, RIN 21 Global Status Report from 2012 showed that, uh, again, it highlights the incredible growth that's taking place in photovoltaics, um, doubling over the last several years, doubling each year over the last several years. Uh, the, the GSR for 2012 shows uh, 70 gigawatts installed by the end of 2011. Uh, 2012 estimates are anywhere from 95 gigawatts on up. I think uh, <clears throat> very soon we're going to be seeing the 2012 global status report. I believe it's going to be coming out in June. And I'm expecting that the 2012 installed capacity is going to be uh, up around 100 gigawatts. And uh, PV capacity estimates have been, a uh, uh, number of estimates have come out of the, these are from the EPIA. Um, 230 gigawatts by the year 2017. I think if we look at the growth that's been taking place recently, that's going to be, uh, that number is going to be surpassed significantly. And concentrating solar power, we haven't mentioned that too much yet today, but I would, um, even, even estimates from about a year or so ago from, uh, made um, 
uh, estimated 11 gigawatts installed capacity. Well, Saudi Arabia alone has uh, targets of 25 gigawatts, more than triple the current market uh, expectation by the year 2030. So I think uh, CSP also has significant opportunity for much more substantial growth. And again, these, like I said, these are uh, reports uh, by the IEA and the EPIA uh, recently. The IEA has also done a roadmap analysis. We heard reference to that and uh, showing that we could have up to 5% global electricity produ production by PV by the year 2030 and 11% by the year 2050. Again, I think these are already beginning to look like fairly conservative estimates. So what's the reason for this significant growth? Well, I, I like to attribute it to the, uh, all of the positive feedbacks that are associated with uh, PV uh, as, a, as a viable industry. Um, the expanded markets are, are achieved through a whole variety of, uh, of a chain of events that all give positive feedback to each other. Uh, certainly private investment has significantly increased. We've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, manufacturing and scale-up um, and product R&D has, um, has all resulted in significantly lower costs uh, in, the, in the price of PV. Um, and, and then, in, in turn, the, uh, th these lower costs and the attractive markets that are being established here in, uh, incentivize governments to come up with even more favorable policies to further expand the markets. So this is a real uh, key for PV growth. Um, I think even though there's been some bumps in the road over the years, the, uh, for example, there is a silicon shortage a few years ago that uh, caused prices to go up, and now we have... Uh, some, somewhat of an imbalance between the demand and the supply, which is causing prices to go down. I think going, the prices going down is a good thing overall, but I think uh, we, we want them to be going down for the right reason, and they are in part, but also in part because there's a slight imbalance right now in the supply and demand, but that should, uh, we expect that to correct itself as we go forward. And again, the R&D has been significant and important in, in helping PV get to this commercial stage. This, this is a chart, many of you may have already seen this, but put together by Enro that shows the improvements in efficiencies of various cell types. Um, these are studies that are done both by government laboratories such as Enro and Fraunhofer ISC, but also by the private sector. Uh, it's, it's important to note that the private industry is investing significant R&D dollars for um, renewable energy research and development. And it's probably exceeding government investments now as we go forward because governments around the world are trying to cut back on some of their R&D expenses. Now, uh, the challenge that I wanted to mention specifically, and we already got some preview of this uh, by Stephen, but that, and that is that um, these technologies, these renewable technologies that I'm talking about, especially solar PV, is variable in its nature, and we call that variable uh, renewable energy. And uh, these, this variable renewable energy adds challenges for system operators. Now, if you look at the, uh, the bottom curve, that's called the net load. That's the load that has to be met not only by the change in the demand over time uh, by the end user, but also by the change in the supply coming into the grid by variable renewable energy. And as the penetration gets higher and higher, the, um, we have to understand better and better how that variable supply is going to be uh, viewed by the utility so they can manage it properly because clearly the, the objective is to give the tools, tools necessary to the utility to manage variable supply. And uh, you can see, and this is an example of a five-day period in April. This came out of the um, IEA study on this topic, but I think it was originally developed under the Western Wind and Solar Grid study. But anyhow, you can see that you're going to get significant changes in the net load um, the utilities are really good at, at forecasting loads based on end-use demand, uh, but it's much more of a challenge to forecast the net load be, that's going to be associated with renewable energy supply, and that's where areas like solar and wind energy resource forecasting are going to become very important tools in the future to allow this variable supply to enter into the grid in a proper way. But, but this, this is just... Um, one key point I wanted to talk about, I think there's a number of other societal challenges that we also must be talking about, such as local and community action. Many of these we've already talked about, urban and land use planning, transportation planning, building design, 
uh, consumption patterns by the individuals uh, and materials use. This, is, this could be a challenge for some of our technologies as we go forward. And of course, energy efficiency and gender and, uh, empowerment, which is an important consideration for many parts of the world. So I think the, the final point, though, I want to really make here is that energy access must be available to all. There, um, is, in, in other words, if we're going to have a 100% renewable energy world, this means 100% renewable energy available to all populations. And currently, we know that there's 1.3 billion people around the world that still lack uh, access to reliable electricity services. Uh, 2.6 billion people are still using uh, traditional biomass for heating and cooking. And the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has uh, come up with a, um, a goal to achieve universal energy access uh, to modern energy services by the year 2030. And um, uh, this will uh, be achieved through lower prices and uh, that's, that we're currently seeing available and, and, and allowing manufacturers to diversify into more risky markets, such as uh, some developing world markets. And microfinancing mechanisms are now available for these types of studies. So um, just to close then, the major challenges. Uh, we've, we're, of course, we've got the uh, low-cost natural gas issue right now. We haven't talked about that very much, and, and um, that could just very well be a transitory phenomenon, but it is affecting our current trajectory uh, to some extent, especially in certain parts of the world. Um, as I said, technically, 100% is feasible, but is there going to be political will? And what are the public attitudes toward this? You know, the public generally doesn't like it when the government tells them they must do something, then they'll take the opposite approach to that. However, uh, with the internet, for example, that was a good example of where uh, it wasn't imposed on the public by governments, the, gov the public accepted it. And I think 100% re renewable energy power should follow along the same uh, pathway that uh, it's the public attitudes will come naturally when they see the value of this 100% renewable energy power. It's not going to have to be imposed on them. Um, there are going to be other emerging technologies to think about, and the, and the availability of materials may be a challenge. And then also, we've seen studies that get us to about 80%. What about that last 20%? That's, that may be where the real costs are going to have to be invested to get to truly 100% renewable. And what are we going uh, to have access to to achieve those um, additional costs? And I think uh, we should talk about carbon pricing as one uh, mechanism, at least in the in the near future, for that. So, in closing, let me just say that um, I, I'm pleased to be representing ISIS, which uh, focuses on a 100% renewable energy for all around the world, used efficiently and wisely. We're going to have a Congress in Cancun. Our next um, biannual Congress will be in Cancun, Mexico, in November, and we'd love to invite all of you here in the 100% renewable organization to continue this kind of a discussion at that Congress as well. Thank you very much.